Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Welcome back to all of our participants today for our reflection on the Byzantine lectionary for the Sunday after Theophany, um, which is the eighth day of the celebration of Theophany. And of course, we, we continue our theme of the baptism of the Lord now, and with a, with a particular focus upon its meaning for us, the communication of grace to our human nature and our calling now, having heard the words of the Father, behold, this is my beloved Son, what that means for us. Uh, so let's, let's jump right in here to Matthew chapter 4. I'll give you the text very quickly for those writing them down in your notes. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 17. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 17, and uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 13. Ephesians 4, 7 through 13. Okay, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 17. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Here we go. At that time when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what had been said through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. On those dwelling in a land overshadowed by death, a light has arisen. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of of heaven is at hand. You know, uh, Father Sebastian, I read through this text, I'm, I'm just reminded again of why it's so important we're doing this study together, because this, here's the text, we, we come into liturgy on Sunday, we hear this, and I think the most that, that, that most of us could get out of, myself included, is, yeah, uh, <laughs> Jesus has come, he's been baptized, and there's a great light, and those that are in darkness have seen a great light, and I'm on the bus. I sign myself up for the bus, okay? But, but the rest of it in between here is total confusion, okay? So that's our job here is to kind of un, to, to clarify the confusion. So Zebulun, Naphtali, I mean, it kind of sounds like Mormon uh, planets and the spaceship that we're going to go inherit or something like that. What is the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, uh, Galilee of the Gentiles? Why is it called, uh, you know, why the Gentiles? Why is Galilee called the Gentile? Where is, where is Capernaum? Seriously, for those participating in her study today, tell me where Capernaum is. In your mind, I want you to draw a map of the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, Jerusalem, and tell me exactly where Capernaum is. And if you don't know, then I ask you, I ask you, why is it that it says Capernaum by the sea and then land of the by the way to the sea, okay? These are very confusing things. These are two different seas, as you know, Father Sebastian. And why is it by the sea versus the way to the sea? We need to clarify all this today. So I know that's a lot there, but I'm just going to say that's my introduction to the context. I'm going to put it back to you, Father, and I'm going to ask you to clarify a lot of this stuff. Make a couple of points here ex examining this, and we're going to pull up here now the, the, the map so that people can see the division of the land according to the tribes of, of Israel, and also the Sea of Galilee now, and the place of Capernaum. Okay, now we're going to pull the map down. Father Sebastian, uh, give us the context of this gospel passage, this quotation from Isaiah the prophet, especially in light of why these people are in darkness, why they're overshadowed by death, at the time, especially in the context of Isaiah, you know, when, when he's writing. Isaiah is a pre-exilic prophet. So when we look at the prophets, we got to look at them first, you know, where do they sit in relationship to the Babylonian exile and destruction of Jerusalem and all that. So the major divisions are usually pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic. So Isaiah is a pre-exilic prophet. So he's looking forward to, 
not in a positive sense, but looking forward to the coming Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. And the uh, and so in light of that, then if we look at Isaiah, we got a place in then further historically, how far is he from that? Jeremiah is is right before the Babylon exile, and whereas Isaiah is way before, generations before. So Isaiah is back at a time when the the southern kingdom is uh, falling into polytheism, pagan worship. The northern kingdom has just been wiped out by the Assyrians. The Assyrian empire has come in from the north and conquered Israel, the northern kingdom. And the only thing left is the southern kingdom that is the kingdom of Judah. And then eventually, of course, two generations later, the Babylonians will destroy that southern kingdom. But we're in this interim period here where the north has been destroyed, conquered by the Assyrians. And, and so Isaiah describes that conquest of the north by the Assyrians as a, a time of darkness. And the reason why he says this is because even though the sun still shined there, just like, you know, anywhere else, the, the Torah, that is the worship of the one true God, the whole meaning of the Torah, the five books of Moses and the prophets, the law and the prophets, as Jesus says clearly, and we can see throughout the Old Testament, is to love Yahweh, the God of Israel, the one true God, with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole self, and your neighbor as your, and, and your neighbor as yourself, that, who is in the image and likeness of that God. So it's monotheism, the revelation of the one true God, the creator. But the northern kingdom had fallen into polytheism. And then when the Assyrians came in and conquered them, it is complete. The monotheism is completely gone from the north. And the, the law of God, that you should worship the one true God and him alone, was understood by Israel to be like a light, like a light shining in the darkness. And the nations were in darkness, but those who had the light, the truth, were as if they had a lamp. And so we hear this in Psalm, uh, in Psalm 119, verse 105. The, your law, O Lord, is like a lamp to my feet, a light for my path. And we can think of like, you know, when you go out in the dark with a flashlight. Back then they had an oil lamp in their hand. But it's the same thing, a flashlight. You have to go outside in the dark in the evening to go uh, maybe take the trash out or something. Well, you take a flashlight with you so you can see you don't want to fall over something. The Jews understood themselves who had the Torah at this time to still have the light down in Judah. They have the light. But the northern kingdom is in darkness. And so, Okay, I'm going to – yeah. well, I'm going to let you pick up your and in a second. Okay. And, uh, and, and I want it because you, what you've done for us very helpful is given like this, this, you know, 30 second salvation history. Okay. So you said the, the entire Torah, the first five books of Moses is all about monotheism, about worship of the one true God. And the problem is, and then you mentioned the Northern kingdom and the Southern kingdom that divide and I encourage our participants to go back to first Kings chapter 11 and 12 as this whole thing breaks apart and then kind of be able to follow it. So you're saying Isaiah is a couple, he's a couple generations just before the Southern kingdom falls, but you're saying that he's living just during the time or after, just after the, the Northern kingdom does follow the Assyrians, right? Mm -hmm. But you can see that, pick that up. If you, if you flip your Bibles open to the beginning of Isaiah and you just read who the kings are right there in chapter one, verse one and two, or just verse one, you'll kind of get your historical perspective. You can flip back to second king or to first Kings then, and you can kind of find those guys in the storyline. So Father special, I'm sorry, you were about to say, and. Well, I don't know what the end was now. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, so that, that's it. So the, basically, in a nutshell, the, the, the light of the Torah, the truth that there is only one true God to be worshipped, and that he alone is, is the fulfillment for you of all things and what you were created for as your, as your heavenly father and you are his son, that idea has been, ex has been extinguished. That light has been extinguished from the north. And so, um, Isaiah, Isaiah has this vision that, the Messiah will come and the restoration of the kingdom will be like a light beginning to shine in the darkness there. So what in the world is the land of Zebulun and Naphtali? And we're going to go ahead and pull up a map, Father. Can you talk to us about that for a second? I'm going to leave the map up here on the screen. 
Mm -hmm. when, the, when Joshua led the people into the promised land, the land had been promised to Abraham, the land was divided into the tribal allotments, the sections of land for each one of the tribes. And so the most northern allotment officially, when Joshua divided these things, was Zebulun and Naphtali. These are the two tribes that got the most way, way up there in the Arctic Circle. So they're, they've got the northern, the northern spot. Dan on many maps will appear in the north as well, but that has to do with uh, something having to do with the time of the judges when some things got adjusted. But that's why we always hear of Zebulun and Naphtali as that most northern spot. Sometimes we'll hear about Dan being the marker for the north, but that has to do with, like I said, some of the judges. So I'm going to pull the map down because that helps us understand then land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, e even Galilee of the Gentiles, Galilee is that whole area, that region, right? So that's, that makes it clear. So, so now these people have been conquered. Uh, they're now kind of under the shadow of, of the idol worshipers or paganism, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. So the darkness that they're sitting in and or they're living in is this darkness, this lack of communion with God and participation in the worship of the one true God, which takes place in Jerusalem. You mentioned that the Torah is the light, which enlightens the people of God. But now in Matthew here, it says that a light has arisen. And that light, obviously, is, is, is talking about Jesus. So I, I, uh, I want you to, if you wouldn't mind, talk to us about that. Why is it that the Torah is light? You kind of began to mention this. And how is it that Jesus now were to understand Jesus as the fulfillment of those first five books of the Old Testament or this light, which the Torah is supposed to be for the people? Jesus says this a number of times, and even though a lawyer who he dialogues with in the gospel says the same thing. So we can see this as part of the Jewish understanding in the first century of the whole Old Testament. This, this, the scriptures of Israel, the law and the prophets are fulfilled in two commandments. Love Yahweh, the one true God. In the, Eng in the English, it comes out as love the Lord your God in the New Testament, but that's coming from the English from the Greek. You go back into the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and other places. It's love Yahweh, your, your God, O Israel, uh, with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole strength. That is not a divided heart, not a little bit for Baal, a little bit over here for Malek and some for Yahweh. That is not to be a polytheist, but be a monotheist. And not just a monotheist, but a monotheist with the right God, too. So it's monotheism, not simply monotheism, but monotheism that is worshiping the one God, the one true God. And your neighbor is yourself who is made in the image and likeness of God. You can't see God, but you can see your neighbor. And so if you, if you, as John says in his epistle, you can't say you love God that you cannot see and hate your neighbor who you can see is made in the image and of God. It's inconsistent. And so, so the law, the Torah was understood then. If, if the one true God is the one who created us and he is our father and in the end, the, our fulfillment, then then this is like a light in the darkness. And everyone who doesn't know this information, this truth, is as if they don't have that light. Mm -hmm. the, the Jews saw the, the Gentiles around them, as St. Paul summarizes them in, the, in, in his epistles, as if they were groping about in the darkness. Like, uh, like someone who imagined, you know, it's in the dark, you can't figure out where the light switch is, or, you, or you're, the power's gone out in the house, and you're trying to fumble around looking for a flashlight. You're stumbling over stuff, you're grabbing this thing, you think, ah, this is a flashlight, you start clicking it, and you find out, well, no, it's actually just a Sharpie or something. They would grab at things and say, ah, this is a god, oh, this is a god, but really, it was just a rock or a tree stump but they couldn't see it. They didn't have the light of the Torah. Whereas the Jew could look at the thing and say, that's just a tree stump. Why are you worshiping it? That's just a rock. And so there's this, this distinction between those who have the truth and those who don't have the truth as if they're in the light and others are fumbling around in the darkness. You know, this all comes to a kind of a head here in, in, in to culmination in what Jesus then says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it's, it, it's interesting in light of what you're saying of this repentance of the, the rejection of these false gods. And when those false gods are rejected, the things of this world, 
then the coming to communion with the one true God begins this restoration of the kingdom of heaven. Um, and I'm just thinking about in terms of, of what we've just experienced in the Feast of the Nativity and Feast of Theophany, that it's really, it's, it's this whole business takes place not so much in the fact that Jesus goes up to Naphtali and, 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 and Zebulun, this area, and begins to heal, but the restoration happens in Christ. The restoration begins to happen there in the fact that his human nature is totally united with his, the, the divine person. And therefore, we, in some sense, return to the worship of the one true God in Christ's human nature being totally conformed to the divine will, uh, which, is, which is ultimately that image is ultimately going to affect how we see our own restoration through, through holy baptism of this covenant union, not as something taking place over there in Galilee or up there in Naphtali or something outside of us, but something very much internally. And the church fathers love to talk about in terms like this, where Naphtali and Dan and Zebulun and Galilee, the Gentiles become the image of our soul. And this place within us where we've allowed the darkness to creep in, the, in a sense, the worship of false gods and our attachment to the things of this world. But within Jesus, the Torah is fully the, the, the will of God, if you will, the will of God, the, the life of God is fully communicated with his human nature. So now that we can, we can now see a man living that life, which is light, which is the life of God, which is the, the worship of the one true God and the conformity of that human nature to that one true God. But with that, before we leave this text here in Matthew, I want to pull up again a map which will show you uh, the Fertile Crescent here, and it'll help to understand this text, Land of Zebulun, Land of Naphtali, by the way to the sea. And this map will kind of help us understand this thing here, this quotation from Isaiah, Land of Zebulun, Land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, because this is, we can pull it down now, this whole area is this massive trade route coming out of the east all the way to the sea, which is one of the, uh, Jesus goes up there and, you know, he wasn't like, you know, just going to the hinterlands. He's going up there to where all the action's going on. The northern tip of the Sea of Galilee is a, is a major trade route by which his message can spread. So we see this land of Zimbabwe by the way to the sea. Earlier, it says he left Nazareth, went to live in Capernaum by the sea. Of course, that's the Sea of Galilee. It's the lake, the lake of Gennesaret, it's, it's a small body of water. But now this way to the sea is this trade route beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So I just want to make that clear. So we're hearing that we understand what's, what's being talked about. So let's move on now. There's just so much to speak about, but I hope we've given enough tools to be able to get into the text there a bit. I have here in my notes that I wanted to share before we read the epistle the Kentuckian for Theophany. Today you have appeared, O Lord, to the universe, and your light, O Christ our God, has been impressed upon us, who sing to you with full knowledge. You came and appeared, O inaccessible light. And I, I want to share that with you just because, because there's a transition now that takes place in the biblical texts which are given to us, in the liturgical life of the church, that now what we have celebrated in the Nativity and in Theophany is very much applied to our spiritual life. The light which is inaccessible has now been impressed upon us. Um, and that's really the theme which St. Paul uh, picks up in the epistle and that we're going to start to focus now on in the ministry of Christ. And that is that this is a calling not only for the Lord, but for us. And, you know, there's one point important point is we look back at theophany that I wanted to make, and that is when we hear the, the words of the Father, behold my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, the great miracle of this is not that Jesus is being called the Son of, Son of God. It's not a great surprise that he's well pleasing to his Father, but that now he has taken human nature to himself. And once again, like in the beginning, at the time of creation, God can now say to man, Behold my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. 
when we hear those words spoken to Jesus in the Jordan River, we have to hear those words spoken to us, we who have been baptized into him. Uh, and as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, I know this whole text is given to us in Ephesians, Father, in the context of St. Paul's teaching on baptism. So let's go ahead and, and read this text together. Chapter 4, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 13. Brethren, to each one of us the grace was given according to the measure of Christ's bestowal. Thus it is said, ascending on high, he led away captives, he gave gifts to men. Now this ascending, what does it mean but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is he it is who ascended also above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave, and, and he himself gave some men as apostles and some as prophets and others as pastors and teachers in order to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the deep knowledge of the Son of God, to perfect manhood, to the mature measure of the fullness of Christ. Father, if, if you could go ahead and give us the context of Ephesians chapter 4, or maybe all of Ephesians, and then we'll try to unpack this in light of, of, of the feast. Sure. The, this is one of Paul's captivity epistles. And so he often talks here about you know, suffering and the life, living the life of Christ. And what he shows here is that it's in our baptism that we're given the gifts we need to go about and live the life of Christ. And it's, like I said, it's in these, it, when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, as he was passing through this region, or as he passing through Galilee on the road to Damascus, he, he ha saw a great flash of light. And, and St. Saint, uh, Saint Paul says, uh, when, when he hears Jesus say, why do you persecute me? He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul realizes that when Christians like Timothy or, or like well, Timothy, Stephen, any, any of the Christians around Paul are being persecuted or suffering or even dying, they're participating in the life of Christ, the sufferings of Christ, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. And, and so Paul in his, in his captivity epistles really meditates upon this because now he is like Stephen, who was being stoned, who had done nothing wrong. Now, now Paul himself is, is being persecuted. Paul has been stoned. Paul has been put in prison. Paul is, and at this point, he's in prison, having broken no Roman law. And so he begins to meditate upon this idea that he is living the life of Christ, who, though innocent, has not, has not done anything to deserve this, has, is, is suffering uh, for the sake of the kingdom of God, living the life of Christ, knowing that even if he might have to go to his death, as Christ did, he will, due to his one baptism in Christ, he will rise from the dead. And so he, he speaks here about how Christians in the church in Ephesus, there are various gifts that are given. They'll, they've all been baptized into Christ. In one baptism, they've all been chrismated, they have the laying on of hands. And so they all have gifts, some of one sort, one of another, as he lays out here. And therefore, all of them are given the gifts they need to live the life that Christ has led them to between that baptismal font and Christ's second coming. You know, with that background, I want to point out something that has uh, always jumped out at me ever since I studied this text here in a chapter four. I studied this first in relationship to the Feast of the Ascension. Uh, of course, uh, speaking about Christ ascending on high and he led away captives. Uh, but in, in Psalm 68, originally the text, if you go back there, I encourage you to flip your Bibles back. St. Paul does not quote, or at least doesn't quote perfectly the text. And it's not because he's doing it from memory, but he's making an intentional change here. And this is fascinating because you kind of get into the mind of St. Paul. And I love that when you kind of get back behind the text and actually stand there with St. Paul, let him talk to you. So he changes a word here, which is, is critically important. In the psalm, it, it says that, that he, he received gifts from men. He received gifts from men. And I want to put that in terms of what you were talking about earlier about the Torah, about the people coming to learn to worship the one true God. And this orientation of our humanity toward 
divinity. Uh, how are we approaching God? And are we in darkness or are we coming forward to the light? But now St. Paul turns this whole business on its head and he changes that receiving image to giving. Uh, and as we know, those who come to the light no longer are simply journeying toward, but now are receiving the gift of. And this is what St. Paul talks about. I, I, I point this out very, I think it's critically important for us liturgically. The church is saying something important to us, and it's focus upon this Feast of Theophany in terms not so much of looking at it from the outside of what, what happened to Jesus. As I, I was just saying this about it's no great miracle that, you know, the Son of God is called the Son of God or that Jesus is pleasing to the Father. It's no great miracle. What's, what's, what's amazing with the miracle, with the, the mystery here is in relationship to what God does for us. He gave gifts to men. He shared his life with us. Uh, and, and if that's true, then what we can say about the Lord, we can now say about us. And we can then go back and reread the, all, all of this that we've said today. Uh, in fact, everything we've celebrated over the last uh, f a few weeks, last month, we can say all of this, not only about the one who was born for our salvation 2,000 years ago, we can say all of this about uh, us, we who have been baptized into Christ, uh, which is why the fathers make this application of Zebulun, Naphtali, and so forth to, to us and to our soul. But, but one more point, and that is that if Jesus is the light who has come to enlighten the world, we can now understand that regarding our call in Christ. As you were saying, St. Paul is very much talking as biblical imagery of baptism, of chrismation, of Eucharist, of entrance into his life. And I would encourage our participants today, reading Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, listening to what you've said, Father, about this, and our, our focus upon receiving that that worship of the true God and how that then affects my life and how I live it, to look at this text in Ephesians chapter 4 and again not read it from the outside. He has come to give me the greatest gift of all, and that is his life within me. But that life becomes, in a sense, incarnate now. Not just, I think, a time we approach theology and our faith, our spirituality, and in this kind of like non-physical way, this very immaterial way that, that then is difficult for us to grasp. But look at what St. Paul's saying. He says, when this life of God comes to you, it is made incarnate in you, okay, in a variety of ways. And, and, and just as he uses this image of the body of Christ, and one is a finger, and one's a hand, one's a, so forth, we all have different ministries within the body of Christ. And he says here that these gifts now affect us. Some are apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers, for the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry. So this, this gift which I have received is not only for myself, but for the sake of the whole of the body of Christ, which is dependent now upon me as I am dependent upon Christ. Until we all then grow up to be, as he says, as you were mentioning, he sees himself living very much the life of Christ. Look at this last line. Till we to the mature measure of the fullness of Christ. Till I, I can say with St. Paul, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I say all this because we have to understand that each one of us is given a gift of ministry within the body of Christ. Not only Father Sebastian, not only Father Hezekiah, every single member of the body of Christ, every single one who has been baptized into Christ. If you have been baptized, then I ask you to, to stop this video for a minute after I ask this question, what ministry have you been given in the body of Christ? In what way are you an essential member of the body in this sense that others, uh, that for the building up of the saints, the work of the ministry, that others have become dependent upon your gifts for their life in Christ? And if, if you can't ask, I'm going to say pause now. Okay. Now we're going to bring back this, this thing after if we paused it and say, if you struggle to answer that question, then I think it's time for a, a bit of a spiritual retreat and a, and a meditation upon this text and prayer to open our life up, say, Lord, speak to me, call me your son, speak to me, lead me 
into the one who is well-pleasing to you. And then fulfill in me the ministry which you have given to the church in Christ Jesus. Let's finish, Father, with the Traparian of Theophany, but also the chanting of the Trisagion, which we sing at Theophany, which is a little different. Okay. At your baptism in the Jordan, O Lord, the worship of the Trinity was revealed. For the Father's voice bore witness to you by calling you his beloved Son. And the Spirit, in the form of a dove, confirmed the truth of these words. O Christ God, who have appeared to us, enlighten the world. Glory to you. And then suddenly we begin to sing. All of you who have been baptized, baptized means be plunged, who have been plunged into Christ, have put on Christ. And I encourage you, go back and meditate upon that Traparian, because you are now living in Christ. The Spirit of God has now come upon you, and the Father has now said, you are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. To Christ our God be glory both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Sending down the Holy Spirit